Custard's Last Stand. The DDoS attacks were the centerpiece and undoubtedly the most effective and eye-catching component of Operation Stop House, but Kampuis and his co-conspirators intended to do more than just temporarily incapacitate Spam House. They wanted to put it out of business for good. On March 20, when Cloudflare appeared to be managing fine, handling the attack traffic, the conspirators tried to find a way to get Spam House kicked off Cloudflare's service. One Chinese counterfeiter in the chat suggested, let me find some customers who are using Cloudflare and send a complaint to Cloudflare. Cloudflare's networking is too slow these days. Even cannot access our sites. We have about 200 customers using Cloudflare's service. Cloudflare will fell overwhelming force. Stevens concurred. No one thing is what will work. This campaign as a whole will end them, though. The campaign as a whole involved not just the DDoS and an attempt to turn Cloudflare's other customers against Spam House, but also a series of attempts to undermine Spam House's online infrastructure and promote the attacker's own anti-Spam House agenda as publicly as possible. For instance, on March 18, as the attacks were beginning, McDonough filed a report with the Who Is database, which is maintained by the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, to track who owns different domain names online. The Who Is database is publicly available online and contains names and contact information for the owners of all registered domain names, except for individuals who pay an additional fee in order to withhold their information from being listed. McDonough's complaint alleged that the entry for spamhouse.org was invalid because the people listed as contacts for the domain were fake names and emails and phone calls to the listed contact addresses and numbers did not go through. They didn't go through, of course, because the organization was under attack and its networks were down. In reporting that the organization had filed incorrect information in Who Is, McDonough was hoping to get the spamhouse.org domain suspended by ICANN. When that failed, the attackers tried to displace spamhouse.org as the top ranked Google search result for people who searched for Spam House. They wanted their own site, stophouse.com on which they listed their many grievances with Spam House to come up first instead. So they started tagging their site with keywords related to Spam House. A Lithuanian bulletproof hosting provider involved in the chat asked, Do you mind if we put Spam House meta tags on Stop House so we can come up first on Google soon? Colon uppercase D and Campuis enthusiastically agreed. The same Lithuanian provider later tried and failed to reset the Google Apps administrative password for spamhouse.org in an attempt to take over the organization's email accounts, which were administered through Google. While the Stop House conspirators struggled to extend their efforts beyond the DDoS attack, to cause more lasting damage to Spam House by undermining its partnership with Cloudflare, its domain, its search rankings, and its email accounts, Spam House launched a similar and much more successful offensive directed at the group's own website, stophouse.com. On March 20, McDonough received notification from his service provider that Spam House had blocked them because of his website, and he would have to sever all ties with StopHouse.org, or they would disconnect his service. When he protested, the provider responded, Unfortunately, our hands are tied. Spam House tell us that you are harboring a known Roxo spammer. We're not happy to be associated with this, 
as it affects other clients whom have no control on the situation. As such, I'm afraid you will need to move this client from our network within the next 24 hours, or we will have to interrupt service. Please update us when this client no longer utilizes any part of our network so we can get back in touch with Spam House. To the Stop House conspirators, this was just further proof of Spam House's unwarranted power and ability to censor sites it didn't like online. McDonough complained, Narco, they treat it like it's a request from law enforcement, not some moron on a boat. E. Data King, right, and this is the reason we fight. Then on March 21, the domain for StopHouse.com was suspended by the registrar that McDonough had purchased it from, called A.H. Names. Compuis was furious and began lashing out at A.H. Names on Facebook, threatening them, If you're not with us, you're against us. Turn it back on, or we turn you off. Take your pick. Eighty gigabytes per second up your ass, or turning the domain back on. Within the chat, Compuis instructed McDonough to target A.H. names with a brief attack so they would know the threats were serious. H.R.H. Prince Sven Olaf von Cyberbunker Heifer Compuis M.P. Send them a few packets so they know. Narco, DDoS on that A.H. names for like one minute. We're not going to change the goddamn domain name. We're going to make them turn it back on. Simple as that. Stevens was more sanguine about Spam House's attempts to blacklist its own attackers. He took these efforts as a sign of the company's desperation, optimistically predicting on March 21, this is very likely to be their version of Custard's last stand. The Stop House conspirators tried to target Spam House on several different fronts, combining one of the most massive DDoS attacks ever witnessed at the time with a barrage of other efforts intended to make the organization lose its customers, web domain, and partnership with Cloudflare. Because the attack was so large and had such far-reaching consequences, even for Internet users who weren't trying to access Spam House, and because Spam House later gave Cloudflare permission to publicly discuss the details of the attack, the incident had a significant impact on the defensive landscape for DDoS attacks. It drew attention to the threats posed by open DNS resolvers and the inability of many targets of denial-of-service attacks to defend against such incidents on their own as well as the corresponding need for intervention from third parties like Cloudflare to absorb and filter large volumes of traffic. The incident, and others like it, also fueled ongoing debates around defining the defensive roles and responsibilities of Internet service providers, the intermediaries best positioned and equipped to help mitigate denial-of-service attacks, and bots more generally given their unique visibility into traffic patterns and ability to identify malicious traffic. Operation Stophouse was a reminder, too, of how the different motivations of attackers can change their tactics, as well as determine the opportunities for defensive intervention. The Stophouse conspirators, out for revenge, exhibited none of the subtlety or inconspicuousness of intruders looking to steal money or secrets, who would typically try to lie low and maintain their illicit access to the victim's computers for as long as possible. Instead, publicity was part of the Stop House conspirators' goal. To take their revenge on Spam House, they needed everyone to know that they were the ones responsible for bringing the organization down. This aspect of the attack not only made the perpetrators easier for authorities to track down and arrest, it also opened them up to counterattacks, like having their domain name suspended and their service provider dropping them as customers. <laughs>
These interventions did not stop the DDoS attacks. Cloudflare's filtering was responsible for mitigating the flood of traffic, but they did make the DDoS attacks less satisfying and less worthwhile for the conspirators. Taking away Stophouse's ability to promote its anti-spam house message was the equivalent, in some sense, of taking away Gonzalez's ability to profit off his stolen credit card numbers or removing China's ability to act on the economic information it stole from U.S. companies. After all, the DDoS attack itself was never the point. The point was proving to the world that Spam House was, in the words of Compuise's Stop House Manifesto, posted on StopHouse.com, an offshore criminal network of tax-circumventing, self-declared Internet terrorists pretending to be spam fighters. To have their own Stop House website declared a spam by spam house, and then to have their service provider and domain registrar unquestioningly accept that designation and suspend their service, only reinforced how completely Operation Stop House had failed to degrade Spam House's influence and legitimacy with other online stakeholders. It was that influence, even more than the technical mitigations undertaken by Cloudflare, that enabled Spam House to so completely triumph over its attackers in the face of a crushing onslaught of malicious traffic. To generate that traffic, Stophouse took advantage of the underlying architecture of the Internet itself. That reliance on infrastructural components of the Internet's addressing system, especially open DNS resolvers, gave rise to questions about who, besides the Stophouse conspirators, was to blame for allowing the attack to happen in the first place. The owners of the infected machines used to comprise the Stop House botnets, the operators of the open DNS resolvers that bombarded Spam House with enormous zone files in response to forged requests, and the Internet service providers who carried and delivered that traffic all played a role in enabling Operation Stop House. But since they had not been attacked themselves, had indeed felt none of the ill effects of the Stophouse DDoS, they had no strong incentives to try to make it more difficult for people to launch similar attacks in the future. 9. An Epic Nightmare The Sony Breach and Ex-Post Mitigation at first glance, the computer virus at Sony Pictures Entertainment, SPE, appeared both amateurish and confusing. When employees arrived at the studio's Los Angeles headquarters the morning of November 24, 2014, their computer desktops displayed a picture of a glowing red skeleton overlaid with an ambiguous, ungrammatical message. Warning. We've already warned you, and this is just a beginning. We continue till our request be met. We've obtained all your internal data, including your secrets and top secrets. If you don't obey us, we'll release data shown below to the world. There was no demand for money included in the threat. No demand for anything, in fact just the reference to an unspecified request. It didn't seem like a threat that needed to be taken too seriously, but the computers still weren't working, so the IT staff shut down the company's internal network, and Sony Pictures CEO Michael Linton and co-chairman Amy Pascal called in the security firm FireEye. Earlier that year, FireEye had acquired Mandiant, the company that investigated the South Carolina Department of Revenue breach and PLA Unit 61398 espionage efforts. So the investigation of the Sony breach commenced in much the same way those other incidents unfolded. But it quickly became apparent to the team of investigators 
led by Mandiant CEO turned FireEye CEO Kevin Mandia, that this was a breach unlike any other they had encountered before. In early December, Mandia reported to Linton, The scope of this attack differs from any we have responded to in the past, as its purpose was to both destroy property and release confidential information to the public. The bottom line is that this was an unparalleled and well-planned crime carried out by an organized group for which neither SPE nor other companies could have been fully prepared. What made the Sony incident unique and, in its way, terrifying and unparalleled, was not any particular technical tool or method that the intruders had used to access the SPE networks, nor was it the vast quantity of data they had accessed, including unreleased movies, scripts, emails, digital certificates, employee databases, payroll information, and health insurance records. In the weeks that followed the November 24 Compromise, as that stolen data began to be distributed to journalists and posted online, it became clear that what really set this breach apart from others that Mandia and his team had investigated was the motivation and mentality of its perpetrators. Whoever had compromised the SPE network was not looking to steal money or conduct any familiar form of secretive espionage. Rather, they were looking to cause chaos, to publicly shame and torment SPE and its employees before as wide a global audience as possible by any means available, ranging from releasing high-level executives' embarrassing email exchanges and salary data to posting employee social security numbers and financial information to disseminating as-yet-unreleased movies and scripts. There was a certain irony in watching these secrets unfold in such spectacular fashion around a company whose primary purpose was public entertainment. The fact that this breach was an entertainment industry story, that it involved movie stars and big-budget drama of every variety, was a large part of what made it such an enticing and exciting story for journalists and their readers. Breaches perpetrated for the purposes of financial gain or espionage can cause plenty of damage, but they tend to follow certain expected and explicable templates that make it easier to understand and anticipate what an attacker will do with the access and data they have acquired and why. But like Operation Stop House, the 2014 Sony Pictures breach did not follow any of those expected templates. It was motivated purely by malice, perpetrated by people who had no agenda for personal gain, and therefore no interest in keeping their actions secret, and no concerns about restricting their activity and the resulting damage to any particular mission. It was the lack of any rational motivation or clear self-interest driving this very public, freewheeling, no-holds-barred assault on Sony Pictures and its thousands of employees, that made this breach different, right from the start. Two other developments contributed to making the incident even more unusual and unprecedented. The first was the very public involvement of the U.S. government in an incident directed at a private company. On December 19, the FBI announced it had determined that the government of North Korea was responsible for the breach, and President Barack Obama vowed that the United States would respond proportionally. It was only the second time, after the charges brought against the members of PLA Unit 61398, that the U.S. government had publicly accused a foreign government of compromising an American company's computer systems and the first time that the federal government had ever appeared to promise any sort of in-kind response or retaliation on behalf of a private company. Companies and government agencies had been talking for years about public-private partnerships for cybersecurity.
But the president promising a response to what was essentially a corporate compromise indicated that the intermingling of public and private cybersecurity incidents and priorities had reached new heights. This response from the U.S. government was surprising, and so too was the response from SPE itself. Far from accepting the conventional wisdom that there was little they could do once the data had been stolen, the studio used both legal and technical means to go after many of the online and media intermediaries distributing their stolen data. These largely unsuccessful attempts by SPE to extend the commonly understood limits of ex-post mitigation by targeting distribution intermediaries was the second development that made this incident so remarkable and significant. Though the studio's efforts seemed to have relatively little impact on how widely the stolen information was shared and reported on, their attempts to rein in the distribution of their leaked data offered a template of sorts for companies and policymakers interested in making it easier for victims of similar breaches to recover financially and to punish those who participated in their public humiliation. SPE's actions also made clear just what was at stake for anyone who took up that template and how stark the trade-offs would be, especially with regard to free speech and free press protections, if policymakers tried to make it easier for victims to control information flows and publication through legal means as a way of trying to mitigate the impacts of similar breaches. The Guardians of Peace Regardless of the perpetrator's ultimate motives, the early stages of many computer security breaches, from the South Carolina Department of Revenue breach to the Game Over Zeus crypto locker infections to the PLA Unit 61398 espionage efforts, look remarkably similar, and the Sony breach was no exception. It began with phishing emails sent to Sony Pictures employees that included web links or attachments containing special wiper malware. The malware program included in these emails, called igfxtrayx.exe, was designed to look like a legitimate Microsoft Windows service when installed. In fact, there is a valid Windows program called IGFX Tray, stored in a file named igfxtray.exe, that is used to provide users with an easy way to modify the graphics settings on their computers. When a Sony employee downloaded the igfxtrayx.exe file from a phishing email, the malware infected that employee's computer and immediately created a network file share connection, allowing it to communicate with all the other machines on the same local network operated by Sony Pictures. That communication was essential for the perpetrators to spread their malware across the entire Sony Pictures network to all of the computers at the company's headquarters. Otherwise, they could only have compromised the machines owned by people who fell for their phishing messages. If Sony Pictures had made it more difficult for the computers on its internal network to communicate with each other, then the studio might have been better able to control the scale and scope of the intrusion. For instance, the studio might have tried to segment their network in a manner similar to Diginotar's system of DMZs and more secure network portions so that a compromise of one computer connected to it could not be easily spread to all of the others. Of course, even that system ultimately failed Diginotar. Besides opportunities for network segmentation, the phishing messages themselves provided an early opportunity to stem the breach. Had those messages been filtered by Sony's email programs or ignored by the employees who received them? However, Training thousands of employees to reliably recognize suspicious emails was, and still is, likely to be a losing battle. 
especially if any individual failure could lead to the compromise of the entire company's network. Trying to isolate and quarantine infected machines by making it more difficult for them to spread malware to other computers might have been a more effective strategy for containing the damage and interfering with the early stages of the breach. As it was, the studio was only able to isolate roughly half of its machines from the malware, and the IG FX Tray X wiper successfully deleted everything stored on 3,262 of the company's 6,797 personal computers and 837 of its 1,555 servers. From the moment of its execution, the IGFX Tray X wiper malware was focused on spreading itself. First, it would try to copy itself onto other computers on the network over the shared connection it had created. Then it would create another four copies of itself and cut off the infected machine's email access by shutting down the Microsoft Exchange Information Store service. The malware then attempted to connect to a set of command and control servers whose IP addresses were hard-coded into the wiper and were presumably controlled by the perpetrators. One of the hard-coded IP addresses was traced back to a virtual private network server in Italy, operated by a service called Hide My Ass, that helped users protect their anonymity online through VPNs. Another command and control IP address was traced back to a Polish import-export company, and a third to a university in Thailand. As in the case of the command and control servers used to control the Game Over Zeus bot, these were almost certainly not servers that the perpetrators themselves directly owned. Rather, they were probably compromised or rented machines that were being used as intermediaries to control the IGFX Tray X wiper without leading investigators directly back to the intruders. Finally, the wiper accessed and deleted the entire contents of the infected machine's hard drive and then rebooted the machine, completely wiped of all its data, to display the red skeleton and warning message that Sony Pictures employees discovered the morning of November 24. That morning, as FireEye and Sony were attempting to regain control of their network, it looked like the destruction of Sony Pictures' data was the primary goal of the breach. But five days later, while the studio was still struggling to get their computers back up and running, it became apparent that there was an even earlier stage of the attack, one that must have taken place before the SPE data was wiped, but could no longer be reliably traced, because so much of the relevant evidence had been deleted by the wiper malware. On the morning of November 29, 2014, several journalists began receiving emails from a group that had dubbed itself the Guardians of Peace, or GOP. The emails included several links to the website Pastebin, a site that lets users paste and store text anonymously. The GOP provided the chosen journalists with a password D-I-E-S-P-E-1-2-3, -E that they could use to access the pastebin links, which turned out to grant access to 26 folders containing all manner of internal data stolen from Sony Pictures, including employee salary information, social security numbers, and performance reviews. As reporters began publishing stories about the data, detailing pay discrepancies and internal disputes at Sony Pictures, the studio realized that at some point before their systems had been wiped, their data must have been copied and exfiltrated by the intruders. Far from losing all their data in the incident, the studio's information was now more easily available than ever to anyone with an Internet connection. One of the unresolved mysteries of the Sony breach is how exactly the intruders managed to steal such a vast quantity of data without attracting any attention or raising any flags within Sony's IT team.
The Guardians of Peace claimed to have taken just under 100 terabytes of data, but thanks to the destruction of the wiper malware, it was difficult to reconstruct exactly when or how that had happened. The mystery surrounding the mechanics of the earlier stages of the breach led to a number of competing theories, including a vocal minority who argued that in order to exfiltrate such a large quantity of data and exploit the studio's network so thoroughly and knowledgeably, the intruders must have had inside help from Sony Pictures' employees. Mandia and many others dismissed these claims as unsupported by evidence, and Mandia later indicated he believed the intruders had exfiltrated the stolen data a little bit at a time over an extended period in order to evade detection. Since media companies routinely transfer large files, like movies, Sony Pictures probably had a relatively high threshold, if indeed it had any threshold, for the volume of data leaving their network that would trigger an alert or investigation. Despite the holes in the early stages of the Sony Pictures breach timeline, it is clear that the studio had at least three crucial opportunities to intervene and interrupt the intrusion prior to November 24. The first would have been to flag the copying and exfiltration of the data that was stolen by monitoring large volumes of outgoing data, anomalous recipients of outbound data streams, regular patterns in outbound data, for example, files of a certain size and format being sent to a particular destination every day or every hour, or even suspicious-seeming staging of data for exfiltration, for example, files being compressed and bundled into a series of archives of a certain size that could then be transferred. As with espionage-motivated breaches like the PLA Unit 61398 missions and the OPM breach, exfiltrating Sony's data turned out to be central to the intruder's mission of publicly humiliating the company. They had to find a way to carry out this stage of the intrusion or give up on their goal of embarrassing the studio on a global stage. At the very least, Defending against high-volume exfiltration would have mitigated the impacts of the breach, even if it wouldn't have necessarily prevented the wiper from erasing the data. The phishing messages bearing the wiper malware presented another possible point of interruption for SPE. The studio might have identified these messages as fraudulent and filtered them out of employees' inboxes. Alternatively, had the employees who received them successfully identified them as fraudulent and avoided the enclosed links and attachments, that too might have prevented at least the deletion stage of the breach. But besides the significant challenges of actually preventing any phishing emails from being received or opened, this was not an absolutely essential or bottleneck stage of the breach from the intruder's perspective. There are other ways of delivering malware to a victim system besides phishing. For instance, the DigiNotar breach exploited a software vulnerability in a public-facing web server. Finally, there was an opportunity for Sony to segment its network more aggressively, so that an infection of one or even a few machines could not be so easily spread to so many others at the company. Segmentation could have helped contain the damage caused by the wiper, and possibly also the exfiltration, by limiting what data the intruders could access based on their initial points of compromise, though it would still have offered few guarantees. DigiNotar's network, for instance, was elaborately segmented into multiple different zones with more than 100 firewall rules separating them and dictating how they communicated with each other, all to no avail. Undoubtedly, the Sony Pictures breach was a carefully planned intrusion, carried out over a relatively extended period of time, using some particularly nasty malware. But in terms of overall technical sophistication, it follows to a large extent 
the same basic template as many previous incidents. Phishing emails, followed by the delivery and spreading of malware across an internal network, and finally, large-scale data exfiltration. The wiper malware was new, but closely related to similar types of malware that had been used in earlier breaches, researchers later found, and it made use of commercially available software drivers to overwrite data on the SPE hard drives without administrator privileges. In other words, it was an effective but not incredibly novel or advanced piece of code. Similarly, the steps Sony could have taken to prevent or at least mitigate the impacts of the breach were pretty standard security practices. Outbound traffic monitoring, phishing filtering and education, network segmentation, none of them impossibly cumbersome or excessive measures. When Mandia called the breach an unparalleled and well-planned crime carried out by an organized group for which neither SPE nor other companies could have been fully prepared, he was almost certainly not referring to the technical sophistication of the incident. Indeed, the previous sentence of his email to Linton makes clear that what sets the breach apart from others, in his opinion, is not how it was carried out, but why. The fact that its purpose was to both destroy property and release confidential information to the public. A later analysis of the incident led by security firm Novetta echoed this point in a report that concluded the group responsible for the Sony Pictures breach had executed numerous successful attacks, due in large part to their organization and determination, more so than due to any highly sophisticated malware. What made the Sony Pictures breach unique and significant, and difficult to predict or prepare for, was not the IGFX Tray X wiper, or any of the other technical components of the intrusion, but instead the vindictive, wide-ranging, destructive impulses of its perpetrators. Sony, however, had a vested interest in portraying the intrusion as technically sophisticated. Otherwise, the major technology company looked like it had carelessly failed to implement expected lines of defense for its network, and not for the first time. Sony the parent company of SPE, had a long history of computer security breaches, and it quickly became apparent in the aftermath of the 2014 incident that the lesson it had taken away from those previous episodes was not to beef up its security, but instead to paint the breach as the cybercrime of the century and its perpetrators as brilliant, cutting-edge, relentless criminals. It turned out Sony would receive some assistance in this mission from an unexpected source, the United States government. A Very Public Accusation Less than a month after the Guardians of Peace made their presence in the Sony Pictures Network known by wiping hundreds of the studio's computers, the FBI announced that it had determined that the North Korean government was responsible for the incident. According to the FBI, the attribution was based on similarities between the wiper malware and code used by North Korea to attack South Korean banks and media companies in 2013. Additionally, several of the command and control IP addresses that the wiper software was programmed to contact were known to be associated with North Korean infrastructure. The FBI stressed that their determination was made only, in part, based on this evidence, implying that there was other, presumably classified, evidence that further supported their assertion. Still, many people were skeptical of how circumstantial the FBI's evidence appeared to be, and North Korea, to no one's surprise, vehemently denied any involvement. The 2016 analysis by Novetta of the wiper malware provided a clearer picture of the similarities between the IGFX Tray X code and other malware that had previously been linked to North Korea.
Analysts found that the code used to infiltrate the SPE network relied on the same relatively obscure encryption scheme called Caracax that was used in malware that targeted U.S. and South Korean government agencies, military networks, and companies in 2011 and 2013. Furthermore, the same key a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, backslash, 0, backslash, 0, backslash, 0, backslash, 0, backslash, 0, was used to initialize the Caracax encryption algorithms across many of these malware programs, including the SPE wiper. Besides the use of similar cryptographic keys and encryption schemes, the analysts also found a common pattern in how the Sony intruders had masked their communication with command and control servers. After infecting their victims' computers, the wiper malware would disguise its communications with the command and control servers to look like TLS, the standard Transport Layer Security Encryption Protocol, commonly used for web browsing, even though the malware program was actually using a different type of encryption. This helped the intruders evade network monitoring tools looking for anomalous outbound traffic because it made the communications between infected machines and the intruders' C2 servers look like normal web connections to popular websites. The malware authors let the wiper choose either www.amazon.com or www.google.com at random and then pretend it was communicating with the selected site when it was instead talking to a command and control server operated by the intruders. The Novetta analysts traced this technique in the SPE wiper code to previous pieces of malware used against U.S. and South Korean targets. They also found that the SPE wiper's overzealous deletion process figured in many of those other malware programs as well. The process involved first overwriting files with randomly generated garbage data and then renaming the files with more randomly generated text and finally deleting the renamed, overwritten files. Despite these similarities, Novetta stopped short of attributing the SPE breach and the other incidents perpetrated with similar malware to the North Korean government, choosing instead to make the more modest assertion that the incident had been perpetrated by an organization they dubbed the Lazarus Group, which had carried out several other attacks on U.S. and South Korean targets using similar tools and techniques. Novetta even pointed out in its report that the IP addresses and command and control servers the FBI had previously traced back to North Korea were not necessarily damning evidence. The Novetta report noted, While the infrastructure used in the SPE attack overlaps with infrastructure attributed to malicious cyber activity linked to North Korea, Previously malicious IP addresses are not necessarily still used by the same attackers. These IP addresses, the ones that had been traced back to VPN providers, businesses, and universities in Italy, Poland, and Thailand, were, in fact, almost all public proxies used by a variety of malware operators in the past, the analysts concluded. But while Novetta was reluctant to place blame squarely on North Korea, the FBI had no such hesitations. The agency's statement left little room for uncertainty or doubt, despite their having had only four weeks to investigate the incident, and never before having made such a public and unequivocal accusation against a foreign government for a computer crime directed at a private company. Something about this incident the FBI indicated in its statement, was different and required a sterner response. 
Though the FBI has seen a wide variety and increasing number of cyber intrusions, the destructive nature of this attack, coupled with its coercive nature, sets it apart, the agency said, adding that North Korea's actions were intended to inflict significant harm on a U.S. business and suppress the right of American citizens to express themselves. The FBI's decision to publicly denounce the North Korean government over the SPE breach was surprising, but the real shock came a few days later, on December 22, 2014, when North Korea suddenly lost its access to the Internet in an apparent distributed denial-of-service attack on the country's limited number of routers. The incident followed closely on President Obama's promise that the United States would respond proportionally to the SPE breach and subsequent fear-mongering by the intruders, including threats of violence that were never realized. Although the United States government did not admit to taking North Korea offline, neither did it deny responsibility for the incident. A State Department spokesperson told reporters, We aren't going to discuss, you know, publicly operational details about the possible response options. As we implement our responses, some will be seen, some may not be seen. For the United States to respond in any way to a cybersecurity breach directed at a private company with something other than an indictment or routine law enforcement proceedings was unprecedented and, to many, alarming. The U.S. government's intention appeared to be deterrence in sending a clear signal that anyone who came after a U.S. company would face the significant technical capabilities of the federal government by way of retribution. But by responding, or even just threatening to respond, in kind, to a computer security incident directed at a private company, the United States took a significant step toward blurring the line between the protection of industry and government networks. Through their response to the SPE breach, the U.S. government not only opened the door for private companies to turn to them to avenge attacks, they also gave license to other governments to involve themselves in industry disputes and leverage their cyber arsenals on behalf of businesses within their borders. By entering the fray to retaliate on Sony's behalf, the United States appeared ready to eliminate or, at the very least, obscure, the distinctions between attacks on private companies and government institutions. To some extent, those distinctions were already eroding, given how much Internet infrastructure is operated by industry and how many systems critical for national security and stability are run by private companies. But for the government to lash out over a breach directed at a movie studio, rather than, for instance, a power plant or a hospital, suggested that the government considered it their job not just to protect the nation's critical infrastructure, but also the reputation and digital resources of every major company within its borders. A Strong and Merciless Countermeasure For Sony, the FBI's statement that North Korea was responsible for the breach was a godsend. It was a clear confirmation of Mandia's earlier assessment that no company could possibly have prepared for such a breach or defended themselves against such a well-resourced, sophisticated adversary as the North Korean government. Incidentally, that assessment from FireEye was so exactly the message that Sony wanted to convey about the breach that Linton forwarded Mandia's email to all SPE employees. Sony, like many firms in the aftermath of a breach, was understandably eager to clarify that what had happened was not their fault, that no one could have been better prepared for the breach or could have known to expect it. There were, however, warning signs in the months leading up to the breach, which, coupled with the company's history of computer breaches, might have led the studio to strengthen its defenses, or at the very least, 
prepare a contingency plan. From the earliest stages of developing Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg's planned movie about North Korea, the studio had been trying to decide exactly how far they could go with the comedy about the CIA-orchestrated assassination of Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The studio was less concerned with upsetting North Korea than it was with offending the Chinese government and alienating a major international audience for the film. Pascal went along with the creator's desire to set the movie in North Korea and call the central character Kim Jong-un, rather than shifting it to a fictional country or ruler, though the studio did soften the title from Kill Kim Jong-un to the more innocuous The Interview. Rogan and Goldberg were also warned by a consultant they hired to change their banking and email passwords and to monitor their online accounts in preparation for likely retaliation from North Korea. Then in June 2004, when the first trailer for the film was released, the North Korean Central News Agency issued a statement calling it undisguised terrorism and a war action and threatening a strong and merciless countermeasure if the movie was released. The threats were sufficiently worrisome to prompt Linton to consult with international relations experts at the Rand Corporation and the State Department. Bruce Bennett, a North Korea expert at Rand, wrote to Linton in June, As soon as they do find out about it, they will likely explore Sony's computer systems to see if Sony is ready to deal with North Korean criticism. Bennett had also consulted with the State Department's Special Envoy for Human Rights in North Korea, Robert King, who deemed the threats typical North Korean bullying, likely without follow-up. Ironically, given how aggressively they would involve themselves later on, in the summer of 2014, the U.S. government appeared eager to distance itself from the skirmish. One Sony executive who spoke in June with Daniel Russell, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, was told that the North Koreans were going to do whatever they were going to do with or without the film, and this was not an area the U.S. government would get involved in. Within Sony, the strongest pushback came from Sony CEO Kazuo Hirai who told Pascal the movie needed to be toned down, particularly the actual depiction of the assassination in the final dramatic scene in which a tank shell strikes Kim's helicopter and kills him in a slow-motion, head-popping, flesh-dripping ball of fire. Here I and Linton both wanted the scene cut entirely, but Rogan insisted that the scene was awesome and the movie was supposed to be controversial. They ultimately compromised by reducing Kim's flaming hair by 50%, eliminating three out of four of the face embers, and changing the color of the head chunks to try to make them less gross. Other concessions on the part of the studio included altering the images of Kim family members who were shown in the film, and writing a statement that described the movie as fictionalized comedy that is not in any way related to current events. Sony took the possibility that North Korea might retaliate in some fashion, possibly electronic, seriously enough to talk to government officials and consultants about the threat, and even to alter some of the carnage in the film. That they did not also ramp up their digital security is surprising not least because the company had suffered a major breach just three years earlier, in 2011, when its popular PlayStation network was compromised, exposing information about 77 million Sony customers. That breach, which PlayStation chief Tim Schaff would later describe in congressional testimony as highly sophisticated and unprecedented in its size and scope, ultimately cost the company $171 million. The costs of the 2014 breach 
were in many ways trickier to calculate. There was presumably some loss of revenue to the studio, but it is hard to say how much. Some movies and scripts had been leaked online by the GOP, but there was no way of knowing how that had impacted their box office performance. The Christmas release of the interview was cancelled at many theaters, following threats by the Guardians of Peace in a December 16 email that said, Soon all the world will see what an awful movie Sony Pictures Entertainment has made. The world will be full of fear. Remember the 11th of September, 2001. We recommend you to keep yourself distant from the places at that time. If your house is nearby, you'd better leave. These threats may have motivated some of the active involvement of the U.S. government and appeared sufficiently credible to Sony Pictures to warrant pulling the movie. But the interview was released online and shown in several independent theaters, earning more than $40 million in online sales and $12 million in theaters. The online sales, at least, seemed to suggest that even in the age of massive and humiliating data breaches, there might still be no such thing as bad publicity. Meanwhile, the biggest embarrassments and highest costs of the breach, both for the studio and the individual employees who worked there, came from the wealth of emails and personal information including social security numbers and salary data, stolen from the studio's systems. A group of Sony Pictures employees filed a class-action suit against the studio to try to recoup some of their losses. An epic nightmare, much better suited to a cinematic thriller than to real life, has been unfolding in slow motion for thousands of current and former employees of SPE, they wrote in the suit arguing that the breach was only possible because SPE failed to maintain reasonable and adequate security measures to protect the employee's information from access and disclosure. The plaintiffs described no fewer than ten types of injury that had been imposed on them as a result of the breach, ranging from the compromise and publication of their personal information to the out-of-pocket costs required for them to detect and recover from identity theft, the time and productivity they lost trying to protect themselves against identity theft, the possibility of tax fraud, and the future costs in terms of time, effort, and money that will be expended to prevent and repair the impact of the data breach. Sony was responsible for these losses, the plaintiffs argued, because of its lax computer security. Specifically, they noted, 1. SPE failed to implement security measures designed to prevent this attack, even though there have been similar cyber attacks of SPE and its sister companies. 2. SPE failed to employ security protocols to detect the breach and removal of nearly 100 terabytes of data from its computer networks. And three, SPE failed to maintain basic security measures, such as access controls and requiring passwords with appropriate levels of complexity and encryption, measures that would have ensured that data would be harder to access or steal, and in the event data were accessed or stolen, it would be unreadable and thus cause less damage to SPE employees and their families. This line of reasoning was exactly why Sony was so invested in the idea that the breach had been perpetrated by the North Korean government, a determined and sophisticated adversary with ample resources that would have been able to penetrate any amount of technical protection. The company quickly filed a motion to have the lawsuit dismissed, responding to the plaintiff's complaint by stating that SPE in every respect, denies liability, denies that it acted negligently or otherwise violated any law, and denies that plaintiffs are entitled to relief. Judge R. Gary Klausner agreed to dismiss many, but not all, of the plaintiffs' allegations, along the same lines as the dismissal of the SCDOR complaint 
and the Supreme Court's ruling in the Clapper surveillance case, Klausner determined that the plaintiff's concerns about potential future harms that had not yet occurred, as well as their claims about losing time to dealing with the breach's fallout and losing the value of their personal information, could not support a claim for negligence because such harms were too hazy and speculative. Klausner was more sympathetic, however, to the money the plaintiffs had spent on credit monitoring, password management, freezing and unfreezing their credit, and obtaining credit reports. Those costs were voluntarily assumed by the plaintiffs to help defend themselves in the aftermath of the breach, not costs directly imposed on them as a consequence of the breach. This was exactly the sort of cost that the Supreme Court had dismissed in the Clapper case as an attempt by the plaintiffs to manufacture standing by choosing to make expenditures based on hypothetical future harm. But Klausner was more sympathetic than the Supreme Court to the idea that voluntary prophylactic costs of this nature might still be sufficient grounds for a negligence claim. Klausner referenced the precedent set in a 1993 case brought against Firestone Tire and Rubber Company for allowing toxic waste from a tire manufacturing plant in Northern California to seep into groundwater. In that case, Klausner pointed out, the California Supreme Court held that Firestone was responsible for paying the costs of prophylactic monitoring of the water chemical levels because the need for future monitoring is a reasonably certain consequence of the defendant's breach of duty, and the monitoring is reasonable and necessary. Accordingly, Klausner argued, it might make sense to hold Sony liable for some of the monitoring and preventative protection measures taken by the people affected by the breach. After Klausner denied the motion to dismiss the suit, Sony settled the case for roughly $15 million in April 2016 and agreed to provide the plaintiffs with identity protection services through the end of 2017, as well as a $2 million fund that could be used to reimburse the plaintiffs for preventive measures they took to protect themselves from identity theft in the aftermath of the breach. The settlement was in some ways a victory for the plaintiffs, who had managed to elicit protections often extended only to customers whose information was breached but also a reminder of how narrowly courts viewed the harm inflicted by computer breaches only in terms of direct financial losses. Klausner's partial dismissal of the plaintiff's allegations largely aligned with previous failed lawsuits trying to hold companies responsible for non-monetary losses associated with data breaches. It reinforced the idea that even in cases like SPEs, where much of the damage done by a breach did not necessarily take the form of financial fraud, financial losses were the only costs a court was likely to take seriously. The settlement's focus on monetary losses also highlighted the fact that even though the Guardians of Peace had clearly not perpetrated their breach with the intention of profiting financially, otherwise they would hardly have published the stolen information online for anyone to access, their crime had enabled many second-order crimes by providing thousands of people's personal information and social security numbers to anyone who wanted to exploit them. Because the case was settled before going to trial, Klausner's theory that Sony might be financially liable for its employees' voluntary prophylactic measures was never tested in court though it left open a possible avenue for trying to extract damages from breached firms in the future. But the personal, professional, and reputational damage that had been done to the people whose embarrassing emails had been leaked, or whose in-progress negotiations had been revealed, carried no weight in court. And yet, browsing through the slew of articles that came out of the SPE leaks, Stories about snide insults exchanged among co-workers, executives' attempts to get their children into high-profile universities, 
entertainment industry salaries. It is abundantly clear that data breaches can inflict multiple different types of harm and that financial loss was only one of the ways the SPE breach hurt the people and firms involved. The dynamics between Sony Pictures and its employees in the aftermath of the breach have important implications for understanding how hard it is to protect all of the different parties affected by a public humiliation-motivated incident. For instance, one way to protect the corporate victims of such incidents might be to limit their financial liability so that it is harder for individuals to sue them, making breaches less likely to take a major financial toll on their resources and therefore less satisfying for perpetrators to undertake as a means of revenge. But limiting the losses imposed on a victim like Sony Pictures in this fashion even if it did deter some would-be attackers, would also effectively increase the losses imposed on its individual employees, forcing a trade-off between who of the different types of victims deserves the greatest protection for which types of harm. No choice but to hold you responsible. Focusing on the financial harms inflicted on SPE employees in the class action suit had the benefit of implicating a fairly clear-cut set of mitigations that SPE could offer as part of the settlement, such as credit monitoring, identity theft insurance, and reimbursements for credit freezes. But while such mechanisms might help mitigate financial harm to SPE employees, by flagging and restricting money flows to and from the perpetrators, the studio itself had no analogous strategy to turn to for containing the humiliating flood of its most sensitive information appearing online. In the absence of a clear template for how to do ex-post mitigation for such a far-reaching and public-facing breach, Sony attempted to fight back against its attackers in two ways. The first was technical. When SPE's data began to appear online, the studio reportedly initiated a series of denial-of-service attacks directed at the sites that were hosting its stolen data, and even went so far as to plant fake torrent files online. They hoped to misdirect users trying to find the stolen films and data to the fake files so that people who believed they were downloading the stolen information instead spent hours downloading empty files. Whether or not the studio successfully managed to trick any users into downloading their planted empty files instead of the actual stolen information, they were clearly unsuccessful in stemming the spread of the stolen information through media sources, which reported widely on the leaked data. The studio also attempted a less technical set of legal efforts intended to try to stop their stolen information from spreading. These included filing takedown notices under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, to try to make websites remove postings of the studio's copyrighted material, such as scripts and movies, as well as sending letters to news organizations demanding that they delete the stolen data and cease to report on its content. In the letters, sent out in December 2014 to media outlets by high-power lawyer David Boys on SPE's behalf, the studio threatened legal action if the recipients continued to publish the details of the breached information. SPE does not consent to your possession, review, copying, dissemination, publication, uploading, downloading, or making use of the stolen information, the letter stated, ordering the recipient to destroy any of Sony's data in its possession. If you do not comply with this request, and the stolen information is used or disseminated by you in any manner, SPE will have no choice but to hold you responsible for any damage or loss arising from such use or dissemination by you, the letter further threatened a bold if largely futile attempt on Sony's part to find a new entity or entities 
on which to shift blame and liability for the breach. Most press outlets appeared to have ignored Boyce's letter, and there was ultimately little SPE could do to stop the further distribution of information after it had left the confines of its own computer systems. Mitigating public humiliation by controlling information flows is much harder than mitigating financial losses by controlling money flows, especially in a country with strong legal protections for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. However, the idea that the journalists covering the breach were at least partially at fault in spreading the stolen information, as the perpetrators so clearly wanted them to do, was not limited to Sony and its lawyers. Screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, some of whose emails were released in the breach, wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times in December 2014, arguing that the contents of the leaks were not newsworthy, and that every news outlet that did the bidding of the Guardians of Peace is morally treasonous and spectacularly dishonorable. Sorkin's language, and in particular his reference to treason, raises the question of whether the spread of stolen information that does not meet certain standards of newsworthiness could, perhaps in other countries under other policy regimes, be more heavily restricted in an attempt to mitigate the harm imposed by this type of breach. Clearly, any such approach would come at the cost of protections for journalistic freedom, making them an unlikely fit for the United States, but not necessarily out of the question for countries that place greater restrictions on speech and the press. Restricting what people can publish is of little value if all of the stolen data is still easily available online to anyone who wants to look for it. Similarly, making that data harder to find online is of little use if it is being constantly written about in the press. Therefore, limiting the accessibility of breached data and limiting its dissemination through the press and third-party websites, the two strategies attempted by Sony through legal and technical means, go hand in hand. Achieving one serves little purpose if the other is unsuccessful, and in Sony's case, it is not clear that either strategy met with much success. For making a lasting impression on millions of people, there were few breaches that could touch the SPE incident in terms of sheer excitement and salacious details. As the class action plaintiffs pointed out, the breach featured a plot worthy of a blockbuster movie, and further, it gave rise to dozens of engrossing news stories, from the details of the pay discrepancies between male and female actors in Hollywood, to the inner workings of a studio executive's efforts to get his daughter into an Ivy League college, to the snide remarks by celebrities about their co-workers. But beyond its value as a rich source of Hollywood gossip, the Sony breach was notable for two reasons. First, the involvement of the U.S. government on behalf of a private company and the government's forceful response and assertions about the origins of the attack. And second, Sony's aggressive, if unsuccessful, efforts to prevent the spread of the breached information online and in the media. The studio sought to mitigate damage both by seeding the Internet with virtual machines in hopes of luring would-be viewers of the stolen content to the planted downloads, and by trying to persuade journalists and media outlets not to report on the leaked data. This active effort to prevent the spread of stolen information suggested a possible avenue for attempting ex-post mitigation efforts that might apply even to cybersecurity incidents motivated by political retribution and a desire to publicly humiliate the victims. But many considered it politically and legally objectionable to target media reports about the stolen information, even if it was a means of broadening the landscape of potential defenses and relevant intermediaries. The hostilities that arose between Sony and its employees in the aftermath of the breach 
as well as the tensions between Sony and media outlets reporting on the breach, highlighted the complex layers of victims, the different types of harm each of them suffered, and the lack of clarity around who was responsible for mitigating those harms. That these different stakeholders turned on each other in the aftermath of the breach was only to be expected, given their complicated relationships to each other and the incident itself. Meanwhile, the unprecedented convergence of public and private interests in claiming the attack was a sophisticated effort sponsored by a foreign government suggested just how intertwined government and industry cybersecurity interests had become, not just when it came to critical cyber infrastructure, but even when the stakes were as low as a silly movie. 10. An Imperfect Affair Ashley Madison and the Economics of Embarrassment The Sony Pictures breach provided a window into the private correspondence and behind-the-scenes gossip of Hollywood celebrities, but the 2015 breach of the website Ashley Madison, a dating site, aimed at people interested in pursuing extramarital affairs, offered something that was arguably even more tantalizing, a chance to gawk at the private lives of neighbors and co-workers. In the summer of 2015, a group calling itself the Impact Team published information stolen from Ashley Madison's Toronto-based parent company, Avid Life Media, ALM, including the names, photos, profile information, email addresses, credit card numbers, and billing addresses of many of the site's 37 million users. As with the Spam House and Sony Pictures incidents, the perpetrators of the ALM breach made no attempt to hide the fact that they were out to publicly shame the company, in this case apparently because of its poor security. In a long manifesto published alongside the stolen data, the impact team claimed that the breach had been motivated largely by ALM's misrepresentation of its own data security practices. In particular, the impact team called out the full delete option offered to Ashley Madison customers to erase their information from the site for a fee of $19 as a complete lie, writing, Users almost always pay with credit card. Their purchase details are not removed as promised and include real name and address, which is, of course, the most important information the users want removed. Rather confusingly for a group's ostensible concerns about the defrauding and privacy of Ashley Madison users, the impact team's decision to release the information it stole harmed those customers much more than ALM's weak security did. The perpetrator's overall plan to punish ALM for its dishonesty seemed to rely on a flawed understanding of how easily Ashley Madison users could hold the company liable for the breach. In a message to ALM prior to the release of the stolen data, the impact team demanded that the company shut down two of its sites, Ashley Madison, AM, and Established Men, EM, a site for wealthy men who wanted to date younger women. They wrote, Shutting down AM and EM will cost you, but non-compliance will cost you more. We will release all customer records, profiles with all the customers' secret sexual fantasies, nude pictures, and conversations, and matching credit card transactions, real names and addresses, and employee documents and emails. Avid Life Media will be liable for fraud and extreme harm to millions of users. In the aftermath of the breach, several of the site's users did indeed bring a class action lawsuit against ALM, but it was ultimately settled in July 2017 for just over $11 million.
or less than 10% of the $115.5 million in revenue that Ashley Madison brought in during 2014. The Ashley Madison breach, like the Sony Pictures breach before it, highlighted just how easily attempts to publicly shame companies through data breaches could devolve into little more than large-scale public shaming of thousands of individuals to whom the targeted company ultimately paid only token compensation for direct financial losses. The costs associated with breaches like those perpetrated against Ashley Madison and Sony Pictures are nearly impossible to calculate in any meaningful way because they ultimately weigh most heavily on so many dispersed victims living out their own personal small-scale tragedies. In the wake of the Ashley Madison breach, the Canadian police investigated at least two suicides that were reportedly linked to the stolen information. Many Ashley Madison users received extortion demands from people threatening to send their friends, families, and employers the leaked information about them unless they made Bitcoin payments of roughly $230 each. And yet the impact team seemed determined to reinforce that it was ALM they were targeting, not the company's customers. Find yourself in here, the perpetrators wrote to users listed in the stolen Ashley Madison data they published. It was ALM that failed you and lied to you. Prosecute them and claim damages. Then move on with your life. Learn your lesson and make amends. Embarrassing now, but you'll get over it. The impact team's expectation that the affected users would get over it was, at least in some cases, deeply misguided. But so too was their idea that Ashley Madison customers would exact revenge on ALM for them in the form of successful lawsuits. The impact team's call to action directed at Ashley Madison customers echoed the goal articulated by members of Operation Stop House of getting Cloudflare and Spamhouse customers to turn on those companies and withdraw their business due to outages and performance issues caused by their denial-of-service attack. And yet, while they certainly succeeded in making a visible public splash, these incidents, both of which were ostensibly motivated by dreams of shutting down a hated company by driving away its customer base, ended up doing little to impact the victims' businesses. Spamhouse's customers, including Internet service providers and hosting providers, rallied to the organization's defense and took steps to bring Stophouse's infrastructure offline rather than deserting the anti-spam group when it was attacked. Similarly, although Ashley Madison served a far less important function than Spamhouse, Instead of driving away the site's users, the impact team's breach, like the Sony Pictures breach, seemed to serve primarily as a catalyst for a number of third-party crimes, many of them financially motivated, and almost all of them directed not at Ashley Madison or ALM, but at the individual users whose data had been leaked. Perhaps leaking stolen information that could serve as a platform or starting point for numerous other crimes was part of the Sony Pictures and ALM perpetrators' intentions and contributed to their larger aim of wreaking havoc and driving up liability costs for the targeted companies. However, even though both of these breaches created significant negative publicity and reputational damage for Sony Pictures and Ashley Madison, the third-party financial crimes that the stolen data enabled, the identity theft or credit card fraud, or extortion attempts directed at individual employees and customers, were never likely to result in any legal settlements that would translate to significant financial damages for companies of their size. The very public nature of breaches motivated by a desire to humiliate the victims often works against their usefulness as platforms for large-scale financial fraud. Since the victims are alerted to the theft and publication of their information at the same time that would-be profiteering criminals are, 
they can take steps to protect their financial accounts. To some extent, the impact team was successful in turning ALM customers on the company. There was, after all, a class action suit and a multi-million dollar settlement, as well as a $1.7 million settlement to end an investigation by the Federal Trade Commission and the State Attorneys General. But that could hardly be seen as a major victory for the perpetrators, since the settlement sums were a relatively small price to pay for a company of ALM's size. Moreover, the various victims of computer security incidents almost always end up turning on each other and trying to take advantage of the ambiguous liability rules to extract as much as possible from each other in the aftermath of a breach, regardless of how it occurred or why it was perpetrated. The impact team's reliance on those liability mechanisms to put ALM out of business and exact crippling damages for fraud and extreme harm seems to have been based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how these sorts of disputes typically play out in the aftermath of computer security incidents. There were some significant embarrassments in store for ALM in the wake of the breach. Most notably, the discoveries that many of the female users on Ashley Madison were fictitious bots, and that the paid delete service was largely a sham. But those revelations appeared to have a negligible, or at any rate short-lived, impact on the company's business. In May 2017, the site's new parent company, Ruby Life, announced that its user base had grown to 52.7 million people, though it declined to say how many of those users were active, indicating an average sign-up rate of more than 750,000 people per month since the 2015 breach. Ruby Life's Vice President of Communications, Paul Keeble, implicitly credited the breach with the site's subsequent remarkable growth, saying, In the summer of 2015, we experienced unprecedented media coverage of our business. If Keeble is right about the drivers of the site's business, then the impact team's actions massively backfired when it came to hurting Ashley Madison by driving away customers. In echoes of the online sales success of The Interview, the news of the Ashley Madison breach appeared to provide surprisingly good publicity for the company. <laughs>